Okay, this presentation, we are going to finish up the words of Isaiah that Nephi quotes. This will be our part four of the great are the words of Isaiah. Second Nephi 24 finishes up his quoting of Isaiah. And then 25 is Nephi's commentary on that. And so this presentation will focus on second Nephi chapters 24 through 25, those two chapters. So let's begin. Second Nephi 24, which is compared to Isaiah 14. In 2 Nephi 24, the Lord through Isaiah condemned the wickedness of the house of Israel. He prophesied that great judgments would come upon it because of the evils within. Generally, these judgments were to be carried out by other nations. Isaiah's prophetic vision of this destruction highlights the role of the adversary as the principal mover of the distress among the nations. By prophetic authority, we see that ultimately Lucifer will fell. Okay, chapter 24, verse 1. God will have mercy on Jacob, that's the family name, and enable Israel, the covenant name, together in the gospel, and strangers will have the opportunity to the gospel through, through seeking out Israel. Isaiah extends hope to us, the house of Israel, that we will be gathered to our promised lands and eventually rest from sorrow. Certainly our, Israel's return to our covenant lands, is a prominent sign of the times. Israel and America are the lands belonging to the house of Israel. The phrase, strangers shall be joined with them, slash cleave to the house of Jacob, means, in ancient Israel, foreigners enjoyed a special status. The verbs joint and cleave, which indicate more than a temporary earthly union, may refer to non-Israelites who, in the latter days, will flee to Zion for safety. Elsewhere, Isaiah prophesies that the foreigners and their kings will join Israel or Zion and save her. Chapter 24, verse 2, the phrase, people shall, be take, people shall take them to their places. The Gentiles will help members of the house of Israel return to their lands of promise. Again, let's define these terms. Gentile is any nation that is not from Palestine or from Judea. That's the Jews. So it says here, Gentiles will help members of the house of Israel. Gentiles is referring to members of the church who live in other lands like America. We, members of the Church of America, Nephi calls Gentiles. So when you see that, he's talking about members of the church. So Gentile members of the church will help members of the house of Israel who've been scattered return to their lands of promise. The gathering process that restores Israel to her promised lands will be facilitated by other nations, people from afar, who will assist in Israel's turn from the ends of the earth. Then these other nations will espouse Israel's cause, and the captive Israel will become a ruler over her captors. This favored condition will be fully realized in the glorious millennial peace enjoyed by the faithful who have truly conquered Babylon, meaning the world. In other words, as Kyle and Delich put it, Babylon falls that Israel may rise. Thus, those other nations who help and assist in gathering Israel will be from far ends of the earth, showing that nations far away from Israel, that would be like us in America, will help such as America. After we have gathered to our promised lands, we will eventually exercise dominion domestically, men servants and maidservants militarily take captives and politically rule over their oppressors, dominate. The phrase, they shall return to the lands of promise, means each of the two promised lands, Israel and America, are the place for the city of Zion, a place for the temple of the Lord, a place of refuge against the forces of the world, and each stands as an antithesis to the place of bondage and captivity. Symbolically, these lands are type and shadow of heaven are a type of shadow of heaven, which is a far better land of promise. If the inhabitants of the land are wicked, they will be swept off, 
an occurrence that is well attested in history for both lands of promise. The land of the Lord, meaning the lands of promise, belong to the Lord. 24.3. We who follow Christ and make his atonement effective in our lives will, in the end, rest from sorrow, fear, and hard bondage. Temporal rest from fear and hard bondage came to the house of Israel under the leadership of King David. David received rest round about from all her enemies in 2 Samuel 7.1 and King Solomon, both of whom were types and shadows of the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, who will give the house of Israel eternal rest. The expression hard bondage recalls the time the Israelites spent in Egypt as slaves of the Egyptian taskmasters. 24 verse 4, the verb proverb or or poem against the king of Babylon. A proverb is an object lesson from which others may learn appropriate lessons. Here the king of Babylon is the object lesson from whom all of us may learn. The satirical or taunting song or poem given Isaiah's own beautiful poetry is a song of judgment against the Babylon of unrighteousness. Isaiah strides through the future in his powerful Hebrew meter, leaving Babylon trodden down and vanquished in the triumph of Israel. The phrase presser seized and golden city seized refers to Egypt was once the oppressor, uh, oppressor of Israel, God's chosen people. But the oppressor mentioned here is Babylon, the world, and her king, Satan. Babylon is used as a metaphor for sin and worldliness. Thus, the king of Babylon would be Lucifer metaphorically. Babylon is the golden city. In that great city, there was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Babylon attempts to imitate in its wicked and corrupt manner the true city of God with its streets of pure gold, as it were transparent glass. The golden city will cease to exist because God will destroy it, as prophets have revealed. 24 verse 5, broken the staff of the wicked slash scepters of the rulers. These phrases mean kingship in its true and divine sense belongs to God. But very early in the history of the world, the wicked gained power from Satan, the king of hell and the prince of the world. When Jesus, the king of kings, comes in clouds of glory at the second coming, he will judge those who have passed the staff and scepter, who have possessed the staff and the scepter, and he will now reign with glory and truth. 24 verse 6, Satan's reign on earth will come to an end, along with those rulers who are influenced by him. It is now time for Lucifer to be persecuted. The phrase, he who smote the people in wrath with unceasing blows, means Babylon's king was cruel and murderous. Also, Satan and his followers apparently do not sleep or rest, but they continuously attack and strike at mortals with unceasing blows. The phrase that ruled the nations in anger with relentless aggression refers to the king of Babylon's, as well as Satan's, very essence is anger, aggression, and the desire to rule. 24 verses 7 through 8. All the earth can now rest from the destructive influence of the king of Babylon and Lucifer. The trees, representative people, now rejoice and sing because Satan has been cast down to hell. No feller, meaning woodsman, a woodsman who chops down trees, that's a feller. No feller woodsman is come up against us. This implies that the king of Babylon had cut down some of the trees or murdered the people. Thus the king was seeking to become like God who has authority to end life. We, in 2 Nephi 20, 33-34, we see Jehovah as the great forester, and hence the king of Babylon attempts to imitate God's ability to cut down nations and people. Yet, as J. Alec Mortar observes, with exact justice, the arrogant woodsman, the king of Babylon, has had the chop. Satan similarly attempts to make people suffer the second death. So, 
Babylon, who had cut down on other nations, will finally receive its just reward from Jehovah, the great forester, and will be cut down and chopped down and destroyed. 24 verse 9. The phrase, hell from beneath, has moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming, meaning those in hell, the world of spirits, know that the king of Babylon will eminently join them. The phrase, it stirreth up the dead for thee, refers to the New International Version reading here is instructive. It says that hell rouses the spirits of the departed to greet you. All those who are leaders in the world, it makes them rise from their thrones. The phrase, chief ones of the earth, or kings of the nations, refers to, these will marvel that the mighty king of Babylon had been cut down and become like them in the world of spirits. Chapter 24, verse 10. Though the king of Babylon was once mighty and ruled with great power and glory, he now has become like unto all those in the spirit world, or spirit prison which causes them to marvel and prompts them to ask, Have you now become like us without glory and wealth? Have you now become weak like unto us? So they will be surprised and shocked that in the end, you're no different or better than we were. 24 verse 11. The king's glory and worldly pomp no longer exists once his body is placed in the grave. Although the king of Babylon may have enjoyed luxury and wealth during mortality, his dead body, like all that of all the deceased, will lie in the dust and worms will eat his flesh. Spread or cover suggests a bed, since the king, who sat on his throne as temporary glory, now sleeps in a cold bed in hell. He leaves his pomp on earth, his glory and worldly power no longer exists, and his body becomes like that of all sinners, people who preceded him, all sinful people who preceded him. 24 verse 12, Lucifer. The only places in the Bible and the Book of Mormon where the name Lucifer is used are Isaiah 14, 12 and 2 Nephi 24, 12. In Doctrine and Covenants 76, 25 through 28, we learn that Lucifer, which means light bearer, was the premortal name of Satan. Because of his rebellion against God, he fell from his position of authority in the presence of God. Verse 25, and was called perdition, verse 26, which means destruction. Isaiah used the story of Lucifer's pride and his fall from heaven to typify the king of Babylon's ambition and eventual downfall. See verse 4. Isaiah's description of Babylon, her rulers, are also a type and shadow of when Satan will be bound and will have no power over the nations during the millennium. Why he will be loosed for a little season after the millennium, he will ultimately lose all power at the end of earth's mortal history. He and the sons of perdition will be regulate, re, relegated to outer darkness. They are the only ones who will spend eternity in spiritual death, in eternal separation from God and any type of glory. President Ezra Taft Benson identified the principal flaw in Satan's character that led to his fall from heaven. Quote, in the premortal council, it was pride that failed Lucifer, a son of the morning. In the pre-earthly council, Lucifer placed his proposal in competition with the Father's plan as advocated by Jesus Christ. He wished to be honored above all others, especially above the Father. In short, his prideful desire was to dethrone God. Can you imagine such pride? Can you see in the purest life we had agency? There was ability to have pride or you could be humble followers. Purest life was just like down here except without a physical body. 24 verses 13 through 15. Lucifer was and is a self-centered individual who secretly makes his own plans without seeking God's assistance. Lucifer contended in his heart that he would exalt his throne above the stars of God, referring to righteous people who belong to God and sit in the assembly of gods. That's what the phrase sit up 
also upon the mount of the congregation means to sit in the assembly of the gods and be like the most high all without obedience to the eternal laws of god satan wanted all those blessings without any of the sacrifice or obedience satan wants to possess a throne that is higher than those of god's other children and desires to become part of the assembly of the gods which would give him equal power and authority with the gods the expression farthest north is an allusion to heaven, meaning a place far away from the inhabitations of humanity. Lucifer sins and errs because of his desires. First, he believes that he is able to exalt himself. Yet the scriptures inform us that no one can become exalted without Jesus Christ and his atonement. See, Lucifer thought he could be exalted without an atonement. Jesus is the way to heaven. Second, Lucifer speaks concerning his throne. Yet no one can possess a heavenly throne without overcoming the world and receiving God's permission and blessings. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am able to sit down with my Father in his throne. That is in Revelation 3, 21. Yet he, Lucifer, shall be brought down to even the side of the pit, where you can hardly see him. So that's what he means, I believe, in verse 15, where it says he's in the sides of the pit. I mean, Lucifer has become nothing. He's nothing now. You can hardly even see him in hell. He's a nobody. He has no glory, no pomp, no in nothing. He has become nothing. Chapter 24, verse 16. They that see thee shall stare at thee, meaning hell's inhabitants will be amazed that Lucifer, who shook kingdoms with his evil intent, has been brought down to the depths. Is this the phrase, is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, means on seeing Lucifer in hell, the inquiry will come. Is this the man who caused such great disturbances upon the earth? made the earth to tremble and destroy the cities, and now he is like an abominable branch, like a carcass that others trample on. By calling him man, Isaiah emphasized here that Lucifer is by no means a god. So when Lucifer finally falls and is cast into hell, they will all be surprised. Him? That's who caused all the problems? He is now a nothing, a nobody. Chapter 24, verse 17, the phrase, made the world as a wilderness, refers to the Lord's creative effort made the world into a place that was called good. But Lucifer's work had an opposite effect, for he made the world as a wilderness, a state of apostasy. The phrase, destroyed the city, refers to Lucifer is the destroyer. He destroys both cities and souls. The phrase, open not the house of his prisoners, means the New International Version reads that Lucifer will not let his captives go home, which is a possible reference to the fact that Lucifer does not want his spiritual captives or those bound by sin to be released. Lucifer's goal, of course, stands in direct opposition to Jesus Christ righteous, Jesus Christ righteous and perfect desire, which is to release from sin, all those who come unto him. Chapter 24, verse 18. Kings of the nations lie in glory. This phrase means the kings who ruled over the telestial earth are buried in magnificent tombs decorated with marble. The once powerful tyrant, king of Babylon, or Lucifer, is not treated with honor, but is cast away with great dis disgrace. 24.19, the phrase, cast out of the grave like an abominable branch. The grave of Nebuchadnezzar, king, Babylon's king, has never been discovered. And Lucifer will never have a grave or a monument because he never received a body. No wonder the kings of the earth, who, though wicked immortality, could still inherit the telestial kingdom, would marvel at his demise. The imagery of cast out of the grave stands opposite Jesus and his tomb, where Jesus arose from the dead and possessed life in himself. He used his own power to raise and exit 
the tomb. Lucifer, the abominable branch, can be contrasted to the useful branch that will grow out of the root of Jesse. So, just as Christ is a root that grows out of Jesse and will save us all, Lucifer is the abominable branch that becomes nothingness in hell. John D. Watts, an Isaiah scholar, summarizes this section of Isaiah by writing of Nebuchadnezzar, quote, The body has not been buried, but abandoned like garbage. Let's see verse 19. He shares the fate of the dead among the poorest people, like the aborted fetus, like the clothes of one stabbed in a brawl, one killed in a fall, one trampled by a mob, or on a battlefield. He is simply dumped in a pit and left to the birds and animals. End of quote. The phrase, the remnant of those that are slain, means Isaiah's imagery here likens Lucifer to the corpse of one who is killed by the sword, the sword wounds visible on the body. According to the law of Moses, any individual who touches the corpse, represented here, representative here of Lucifer, becomes ritually unclean and impure. Those who remain unclean, having forsaken Christ and his atoning sacrifice, cannot enter the celestial temple or heaven. The phrase, as a carcass trodden under feet, means Lucifer is likened to a carcass that has not received a proper burial. Instead, it has been left on the ground to be trampled by a man or animals. This analogy is more meaningful when considered in light of Joseph Smith's words, quote, The place where a man is buried is sacred. One of the greatest curses the ancient prophets could put on any man was that he should go without a burial. See, again, Lucifer will never have a burial because he never had a body. And so he is such cursed for eternity. 2420, the phrase, thou shalt not be joined with them in burial, means Lucifer, because of his destructive and murderous acts, will not join the kings of the nations, 14 verse 18, who receive monumental tombs. The Lucifer, of course, never received a body, and therefore will never be buried. The phrase, thou hast destroyed thy land, means Lucifer code ha Lucifer's code has always been more in destruction against both humanity and and nature. The phrase slain thy people means Lucifer uses men as instruments by tempting them to murder, murder their fellow beings. Lucifer also leads people away into destruction. In a sense, he slays their souls so that they will suffer spiritual death. The phrase the seed of evildoers shall never be renowned means Lucifer or the king of Babylon and others like them will not be honored, honored or acclaimed in the eternities. 24 verse 21, the children of evildoers will perish because they heeded their wicked father's sayings. The righteous will possess the lands of promise and build cities of Zion for the pure in heart. The wicked, however, will not be blessed to inherit such cities of Zion. The wicked will perish because they heeded their wicked fathers. 24 verse 22. The Lord will destroy all things connected to Babylon. The term cut off is, in, is the same as excommunication. Hence, those in Babylon who are cut off will be excommunicated from God and his saints, and they will not have any part of God's covenant. The reference to son and nephew here indicates that the line of inheritance will be cut off to make room for the new King Messiah to reign. 24 verse 23, Babylon's destruction will be so complete that bittern, variously translated as owl or hedgehog or waterfowl, will inhabit it, and there will be no regular irrigation or cultivation of the soil, and the place will become a swamp, just as one sweeps his or her house to eliminate dust and dirt, so will God sweep Babylon of her foul matter so that none remains. There is nothing left of the king of Babylon today over in Iran. 24 verses 24 verse through 27. The phrase Assyria was like Babylon. 
In addition to his use of the Babylonian Empire as a symbol of spiritual Babylon, Isaiah also sketches the demise of the great Assyrian Empire, which in the days of Hezekiah met crushing defeat upon the hills of Jerusalem at the hands of an angel of destruction. Assyria also serves as a type of the world. In like manner will all evil nations feel the hand of God's judgment. Verse 24, the phrase, as I have thought, so shall it come to pass, means all of God's words will be fulfilled. Though the heavens and the earth pass away, my words shall not pass away, but shall all be fulfilled, as said in Doctrine and Covenants. The phrase, as I have proposed, so shall it stand, means Jehovah's plans are certain. What he says will happen. Verse 25, the Assyrians will come upon Palestine and cause destruction because of Israel's wickedness. The fulfillment of this prophecy is chronicled in Isaiah 36. However, upon my mountains I will tread him, Assyria, underfoot. After the Assyrians have fulfilled the Lord's purposes, he, Jehovah, will trample on them as if they were dust. That them is the Assyrians. Verse 26, the phrase, purpose that is proposed upon the whole earth is, this is the Lord's decision and it will certainly come to pass. The phrase, hand that is stretched out upon the nations, refers to, Assyria wanted to conquer all nations, 1014, but the Lord, Isaiah 1014, but the Lord's purposes are greater. He is in control of all nations and has power over all the earth. Verse 27, the Lord of hosts hath proposed, and who shall disannul? That phrase refers to when God devises a divine plan, no being has the power to obstruct or hinder. This is why we can put our faith in Heavenly Father in Jesus Christ, for what they say will happen, and they know all things. 24 verses 28 through 32 is judgment against the Philistines. This revelation given to Isaiah is yet another prophecy directed to one of the world's kingdoms. It shows that the Lord's prophets do not sever the house of Israel alone. The Philistines are warned against rejoicing over the temporary defeat of the Assyrian forces because Assyria will eventually regroup wars against Philistia and destroys her. Meanwhile, the Lord has established Zion, and all who wish to become a part of her will find rest and peace. 24 verse 28, in the year that King Ahaz, Ahaz, Ahaz died. The date of Ahaz's death was probably between 740 and 714 B.C. The word burden means this is a prophecy of desolation and destruction on a wicked nation. 24 verse 29, the phrase, Rejoice not thou, whole Palestinia, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken. This refers to Palestine, or Philistia is warned, not to celebrate Assyria's, the serpent's, lost power, because the Assyrians will regain their strength. The serpent's seed will produce a cockatrice, another poisonous serpent, and once again smite the Philistines. The phrase, his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent, refers to. Isaiah again uses imagery to describe how the poisonous snake of Syria will produce offspring that will war against the Philistines. The serpent is called fiery, probably because of its terrible burning venom. It is called flying, probably because of the speed with which it makes, with which it strikes. 24 verse 30. The phrase, firstborn of the poor shall feed. This means those who are humble and who suffer, the poor and the needy, will join Zion, which was founded by Jehovah, and shall, allow down, and shall lie down in safety. That I, 1432 is referenced to Isaiah 1432. The phrase, I will kill thy root will with famine means God will create a famine in Philistia or Palestine that will destroy its remaining inhabitants after the wars with Assyria have ended. The root may refer to the Philistines who are yet producing children, those who are about to bring forth another generation. 24 verse 31. Howl ye, howl, O great slash cry, O city. 
This refers to the inhabitants of Philistia's cities will well and mourn once the Assyrians begin their destructive advances. The phrase, come from the north of smoke, means smoke represents the burning cities the Assyrians destroy by fire as they advance southward towards Philistia. The phrase, none shall be alone in his appointed times, refers to the Jerusalem Bible reads, there are no deserters in those battalions, which means that all enlisted men who belong to the Syrian army are mighty warriors. There are no cowards or deserters among them. None shall stand alone in an appointed time. None of them will go AWOL. They will stand firm. 24 verse 32, the phrase, what shall... The what shall then answer the messengers of the nations means when envoys from various nations ask how they may be saved from a series of destructive forces, they will find comfort in knowing that the Lord hath founded Zion. The Lord himself has established a place for the pure in heart to dwell. Indeed, he is the very foundation of it. He is our safe foundation and our sure foundation. The phrase, poor of his people shall trust in it, means the poor will find both temporal and spiritual salvation in Zion. That is winding up the quote of Isaiah, and so now here is Nephi commenting in all those chapters. Second Nephi, chapter 25. 25, 10 through 30, 25, verse 10 through Chapter 30, verse 18, Nephi's Sermon to Jews, Children of Lehi, and Gentiles. The following overview provides a summary of 2 Nephi, chapters 25 through 30, which make up a sermon given by Nephi to three different groups of people, the Jews, the children of Lehi, and the Gentiles. So this 25 starts this sermon, which goes through chapter 30. First, Nephi's message to the Jews, 2 Nephi 25, 10-20. Destruction of Jerusalem, captivity in Babylon, and then return of Jerusalem. Jewish rejection of Christ, his crucifixion and resurrection. Jerusalem destroyed again in 70 A.D. and A.D. 134. See verse 14. Subsequent scattering of the Jews. This is in 25 verses 17 through 20. Now Nephi's message to the children of Lehi. This is in 2 Nephi 21 through chapter 26, 11. Nephi's writings preserved and handed down. Joseph's posterity will be preserved. It's 25, 21. Nephi rejoices in Christ per, per purpose of the law of Moses. 2 Nephi 25, 23-30. Signs followed by destruction. Christ visits the Nephites. Destruction of the Nephites. That's chapter 26, verses 1-11. through 11. Nephi's message to the Gentiles is in 2 Nephi 26, 12, through chapter 29, 14. Jesus is the Christ, chapter 26, 12-13. Prophecies of the last days, that's 26, 14 through chapter 29, 14. One, the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, 2 Nephi 27. Two, the worth of the Book of Mormon, 2 Nephi 28. And three, a warning to those who reject the Book of Mormon, that's 2 Nephi 29. Then in a summary is found in 2 Nephi 30, 1 through 8. To the Gentiles, see verses 1 through 3 in chapter 30. To the children of Lehi, verses 4 through 6 and 30. And then to the Jews, verses 7 through 8 in chapter 30. Nephi gives a summary. So now, let's start with chapter 25, 1 through 8. The first eight verses of this chapter represents Nephi's keys to understanding Isaiah the principles of which were dealt with earlier in the presentation on 2 Nephi 12-19. through 19. So if you want to find the keys to understanding Isaiah, then watch my presentation on 2 Nephi 12-19. through 19. Chapter 25, verse 4, the phrase filled with the spirit of prophecy. President Joseph Fielding Smith clarified the phrase, the spirit of prophecy, and how we might attain the gift. Quote, 
Revelation may be given to every member of the church. The prophet said that every man should be a prophet, that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It is not only the privilege, but the duty of each member of the church to know the truth, which will make him free. This he cannot know unless it is revealed to him. The gift of the Holy Ghost is given to members of the church so that they might have the spirit of prophecy and revelation. Let it be understood, however, that they will not receive revelation or guidance for the church. End of quote. Just for your lives and what you have stewardship over, do you receive revelation for? So if someone claims that if you receive revelation, the church should be doing such and such, you can know that that came from the devil and not from Heavenly Father. There's only one who has the keys to do that, and that's the president of the church. Chapter 25, verse 9. One, the phrase, one generation, hath been destroyed among the Jews because of iniquity, meaning the Babylonians' destruction of the Jews is but a pattern for all destructions of the Jews, as well as for all who choose to reject the Messiah and his church. The phrase, save it were foretold them by the prophets, means the Lord God is merciful and gracious, eager to provide every opportunity for the wayward to repent and for the errant to improve and change. The Lord sends prophets to point up specific grievances which he has with his people. These prophets prov provide pro reproof, correction, and divine instruction, which, when followed, will lead the sinner back to the path of salvation. Chapter 25, verses 10 through 11, the phrase, Those at Jerusalem destroyed and taken captive, notwithstanding they shall return. So you can see that in 1 Nephi 10, 3 and 2 Nephi 6, 9, that even though Jerusalem is destroyed and taken captive, they return 70 years later from Babylon. Chapter 25, verse 12, the phrase, they will reject him because of their iniquities, means the Savior, like his prophets, will be rejected and spurned because of the lack of vision of those whom he preached. The quiet and peaceful truths of heaven are not able to penetrate the hard heart. Likewise, those with stiff necks are not able or willing to bow the head in humble reverence towards the Lord and those whom he sends in his name. Those who knowingly have sinned and willfully continue in sin are confronted with the painful reality, humility, and agony of repentance or the enticing alternative of denial. Those choosing denial over repentance thereby harden their hearts, stiffen their necks, shun, and eventually fight the light of truth and thus become the enemies of to God and all righteousness. 25 verse 13, the phrase, they will crucify him. As discussed earlier, see 1 Nephi 19.10, the manner in which Savior would be put to death was foreknown for centuries by prophets and worthy members of the church. The phrase, he shall rise with healing as his wings, means, that is, the mass will rise with healing in his extremities. The Hebrew word for wings means the, the extremity of something, the, the length of something. Like the, the extremity of a robe would be the hem down at the bottom. The extremity of the birds would be the end of its wings. So the Messiah will rise with healing in his extremities, with the marks of death and the, purpose of, and the promise of life in his hands and his feet. See, he suffered even to his extremities from head to toe. Nephi was undoubtedly quoting the prophet Zenos on this matter, just as Malachi would do 200 years following Nephi. Elder Richard G. Scott of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles spoke of the need for the healing effects of the atonement, not just for forgiveness of transgression, but for all of life's hardships. Quote, the Savior has raised from the dead with healing in his wings. Oh, how we all need the healing the Redeemer can provide. Mine is a message of hope for you who yearn for relief from heavy burdens that have come through have come through no conscious act of your own while you have lived a worthy life. It is based on principles embodied in the teachings of the Savior. 
Your challenge may be a serious physical disability, a struggle, a struggle with lingering illness, or a daily wrestle with a life-threatening disease. It may have roots in the death of a loved one, the anguish caused by another bound by sin, or abuse in any of its evil forms. Whatever the cause, I testify that lasting relief is available on conditions established by the Lord. End of quote. We sing in the phrase, I don't, my Redeemer lives, that he came to wipe away my tears, not to take them away. There are some things we just have to go through, and the only way we'll get through it is through the grace of Jesus Christ that is provided by his atonement. Grace means enabling power. Christ has power that can enable us to do things that we cannot do on our own, and some of that will be some of the suffering that we will have to suffer we will need his, his enabling grace to help us through those sufferings in mortality. Chapter 25, verse 14, Jerusalem shall be destroyed again. This prophecy, similar to the one delivered by Christ himself just days before his death, pertains to the destruction of Judah by the Roman legion under Titus in AD 70. On this dreadful occasion, hundreds of thousands of Jews were killed, and almost 100,000 were taken captive. Jewish tradition holds that the destruction of the Temple of Herod and the raising of Jerusalem took place on the 19th of the Hebrew month of, that's 29th of August, the same day the Babylonians had laid final siege to the city over 600 years earlier. The destruction and scattering in AD 70 occurs for the same reason as that in 58 587 B.C., rejection of the true Messiah, his church, and his anointed servants. Chapter 25, verse 15, the phrase, the Jews shall be scattered among all nations. In the province of God, the scattering of Israel and dispersion of believing blood is a leaven to the nations of the earth. Though the scattered state is something which Israel constantly seeks to ameliorate, something for which she seeks deliverance, it is in this way that the promises of the Lord to Abraham that his name would be had in honor, honorable remembrance among all nations, will find its fulfillment. The phrase Babylon shall be destroyed means, as strange as it may have sounded, to a person in 600 BC, even the great Babylonian empire would come to an end, would be humbled to the dust by God, who holds the destiny of all nations in his hands. By approximately 530 BC, the Persian empire under Cyrus would defeat the Babylonians and become the world power and the means by which Jews would be allowed to return to their homeland in Judea. Indeed, the ancient Babylon will be but the symbol of demise of all worldly powers when Christ comes to gather Israel, a final time and reign as king of kings. The phrase, the Jews shall be scattered by other nations, meaning neither Babylon nor Rome have any unique distinction upon the claim of having persecuted the Jews. The Jews would be persecuted as the scapegoat as the scapegoat driven into the wilderness among virtually all nations. It remained, however, for the 20th century, a day of self-proclaimed enlightenment for man's inhumanity of man to descend to the dark valleys of a hellish holocaust. In the 20th century, we see the hellish holocaust the Jews will go through at the hands of the German Empire. Chapter 25, verse 16, the phrase, until they shall be persuaded to believe in Christ, refers to, the gospel will go to the Jews in the Lord's own way and in his own time. The message of salvation must be presented and received only by persuasion, by long-suffering, by gentleness and meekness and love unfeigned. To accomplish this very end, the Book of Mormon has been revealed in our day with the divinely ordained mission to convince Jew and Gentile that Jesus is their Christ and that salvation is in him. As shown repeatedly in the Book of Mormon, persons of all persuasions, Jews and Gentiles, are scattered whenever they reject the Christ and his church. However, when they humble themselves, listen, respond to the testimony of the Lord's legal administrators, and receive the ordinances of salvation, then and only then are they gathered into the true fold and to the lands of their inheritances, those places where the saints of that age are assembled. The phrase, believe in Christ and worship the Father in his name, 
means we worship God, the Eternal Father, in the name of His only begotten Son by the power of the Holy Ghost. God is the ultimate object of our worship. True worshipers, Jesus taught the Samaritan woman, shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him, for unto Him hath God promised the Spirit. We only worship Christ in the sense that we try to emulate Him. Our main object of worship is Heavenly Father. Jacob, brother of Nephi, taught, For this intent we have written these things, that they may know that we knew of Christ, and we had a hope of his glory many hundred years before his coming. And not only we ourselves had a hope of his glory, but also all the holy prophets who were before us. Behold, they believed in Christ and worshipped the Father in his name, and also we worshipped the Father in his name. A modern reverend likewise explained that God the Father created male, Man, male and female, after his own image, and in his own likeness, created he them, and gave unto them commandments, that they should love him and serve him, the only living and true God, and that he should be the only being whom they should worship. In short, men must repent and believe on the name of Jesus Christ, and worship the Father in his name, and endure in faith on his name to the end, or they cannot be saved in the kingdom of God. In Christ's name could also mean in his authority. Through Christ's authority, we can now be worthy to come and worship the Father. The phrase, with pure hearts and clean hands, means Joseph Smith taught that one of the primary reasons for gathering Israel was to construct temples so that the ordinances of salvation and the glories of God's kingdom might be revealed to the chosen lineage. Those who are able to ascend to the hill of the Lord and go up to the mountain of the Lord's house, those who have accepted the true Messiah and cleansed themselves sufficiently to enter the temple of the Lord worthily, these are they who have gathered in the highest spiritual sense. The phrase, and look not forward any more for another Messiah. During the time of the Babylon captivity, there was a marked shift marketed shift in emphasis and accentuation of the work of the scribe and a de-emphasis on the prophetic oracle. The knowledge of the worldly wise, those dominated by men as worthy of emulation, actually came to be valued by large numbers more than the inspired declaration of those called of God. Many and varied other doctrines which were lost in the understanding which were cloaked Cloud, were clouded during this period of Jewish apostasy. Chief among doctrinal distortions was the Jewish concept of the Messiah, the condescension of the great God so dearly taught on the brass plates among the Nephites, which was veiled in mystery and obscured in symbolism and metaphor. By the time of the first century, most Jews were looking simply for political deliverance at the hands of a conquering hero, a Davidic king who would smash the Roman images and break the yoke of cruel overlords. False messiahs had risen, zealots, nationalistic Jews, seeking to accomplish the work of the long-awaited messiah, had been killed and imprisoned. Thus, those who were looking beyond the mark the scribal society and his followers, those who had confused tokens with covenants and rituals with religion, failed to recognize their Messiah. They were able to read the weather patterns, but unable to read the signs of the times. The Jews at the time of Christ were looking for a physical overthrow of the Roman Empire and to be free of the Roman Empire. That's what they thought the Messiah was first to come to do. They didn't realize he was first to come as the spiritual Messiah who would atone for the sins of mankind. They got the first and second comings of the Messiah mixed up because of the state of apostasy that they were in. And they no more had prophets who were receiving revelation. The anticipation of the Messiah continued in Judaism, and hopes were raised, but then shattered in the rise of such personalities as Bar Kokhba, in noted rabbis, and as late as in Sabbatai Sevi. Today, many Jews no longer look for a literal Messiah, but have metaphorized the doctrine. They look forward to the coming of a great messianic age. 
Even those in the Christian world today who profess allegiance to Christ have not received him in the fullest sense. The greatest evidence of a modern people's inability to read and discern the signs of the times is their failure to accept the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as the predicted kingdom of God on earth. Elder Bruce R. McConkie asks the following questions of the religious world. Who will believe our words? Who will hear our message? Who will honor the name of Joseph Smith and accept the, restore, the gospel restored through his instrumentality? We answer the same people who have believed the word of the Lord Jesus and the ancient apostles and prophets had they lived in their day. If you believe the words of Joseph Smith, you would have believed what Jesus and the ancients said. If you reject Joseph Smith and his message, you would have rejected Peter and Paul and their message. If you accept the prophets whom the Lord sends in our day, you also accept the Lord whom, who sent them. If you reject the restored gospel and find fault with the plan of salvation taught by those whom God has sent in the latter days, you would have rejected those same teachings as they fell from the lips of the prophets and apostles of old. End of quote. Only through apt attention to the prophetic word and the quiet whisperings of the Spirit can Israel in any age come to know the divine sonship of the lowly Nazarene. You can only come to know that Jesus is the Christ and that Heavenly Father is his, spirit, his Father by the Spirit of Revelation. That knowledge only comes by Revelation. 25, 15 through 17, the return of Judah. President Wilford Woodruff spoke to the people of the tribe of Judah, highlighting the great blessings to be realized as they fulfill the work prophetically appointed to them, that of gathering to take possession of their homeland and rebuilding the great temple in Jerusalem. This is the will of your great Elohim. I'm now quoting President Wilford Woodruff. This is the will of your great Elohim, O house of Judah, and whenever you shall be called upon to perform this work, the God of Israel will help you. You have a great future and destiny before you, and you cannot avoid fulfilling it. You are the royal chosen seed, and the God of our Father's house has kept you distinct as a nation for 1,800 years, under all the oppression of the whole Gentile world. When you meet with Shiloh, your king, you will know him. Your destiny is marked out. You cannot avoid it. It is true that after you return and gather your nation home and rebuild your city and temple, that the Gentiles may gather together their armies to go against you to battle. But when this affliction comes, the living God that led Moses through the wilderness will deliver you, and your Shiloh, who is Christ, will come and stand in your midst, and he will fight your battles, and you will know him, and the afflictions of the Jews will be at an end. End of quote. That is interesting. See, there has to be a temple before Christ's second coming in Jerusalem. And at least according to President Wilford Woodruff, Joseph Smith prophesied that one of the signs that we're getting close to second coming, there'll be a temple in Jerusalem. President Woodruff seems to indicate in here that it's the Jews who will build that particular temple. That'll be interesting to see. And maybe it's converted Jews to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints who will build it. Chapter 25, verse 17, A Marvelous Work and a Wonder. The phrase, A Marvelous Work and a Wonder, also appears in Isaiah 29, 14, and refers to the restoration of the gospel in the latter days. In 2 Nephi 27, we read of the important role of the Book of Mormon in this restoration. Isaiah prophesied that as the Book of Mormon would help dispel the darkness of almost 2,000 years of apostasy, the wisdom of the supposed wise and learned would perish, and the understanding of the prudent would become to naught. President Gordon B. Hinckley related some of the remarkable events that constitute this marvelous work in a wonder. Quote, that glorious day dawned in the year 1820 when a boy, earnest and with faith, walked into a grove of trees and lifted up his voice in prayer, seeking that wisdom which he felt so much needed. There came in response a glorious manifestation. God the Eternal Father and His risen Lord Jesus Christ appeared and spoke with him. The curtains which had been closed for much of two millennia were parted to usher in the dispensation of the fullness of times. There followed the restoration of the holy priesthood, first the Aaronic, then the Melchizedek, under the hands of those who held it anciently. Another testament, speaking as a, a voice from the dust, 
came forth as a second witness to the reality and divinity of the Son of God, the great Redeemer of the world. Keys of divine authority were restored, including those keys which are necessary to bind families together for time and eternity in a covenant which death could not destroy. The, small, the stone was small in the beginning. It was hardly noticeable, but it has grown steadily, and it is rolling forth to fill the earth. End of President Hinckley's quote. Chapter 25, verse 18, the phrase, which words shall judge them at the last day, refers to, men are judged according to the light knowledge they have received, the spiritual records in their possession, and also the commandments and divine directives delivered by legal administrators in their own day. Members of the church, in the dispensation of fullness of times, will be judged by the doctrines and standards set forth in the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl, the Pearl of Great Price, and the words of the living oracles, meaning the living prophets. The phrase, for the purpose of convincing them of the truth Messiah, referred to, scriptural records are given for the purpose of bearing witness of God the Father and of salvation available through faith on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ. The phrase, there is save one Messiah, means there is none other name given under heaven, Nephi taught, whereby man can be saved, except the name, and name could be also authority, except through the authority and name of Christ. Among the apostate traditions common to the Jews was that of multiple messiahs. The messianic prophecies of the Old Testament spoke of Christ as a triumphant king, have reference to his second coming, age, see Isaiah 40, 1 through 5, and as a suffering servant, having reference to his mortal ministry, see Isaiah 53. Those possessing the spirit of inspiration recognized that these prophecies would find fulfillment in the Son of God. Those who had lost the spirit of inspiration, having their hearts set upon the things of the world, sought a temporal salvation, one at the hands of a conquering hero like the ancient David. Not being able to countenance a Messiah who would suffer and die, they refused to associate the prophecies of Christ's suffering with their anticipated national redemption. Thus, there developed among many Jews the idea that the suffering servant prophecies would not be fulfilled by the same person as the prophecies which spoke of their liberation at the hands of the triumphant one. So you can see, the state of apostasy Israel is in and how they've mixed up the complete doctrines of when Christ would first come and his second coming and that it would be the same person. Succeeding generations embellished and extended such traditions to the point that many prophecies relative to the return of the ancient prophets were confused and intertwined with the prophecies of the coming of the Messiah. Because Messiah means anointed one in Hebrew, it was a simple matter to confuse all prophecies relative to the coming of various of the Lord's anointed servants with the Messianic figure. The Essenes, for example, anticipated the coming of a prophet of restoration, a priestly Messiah, and a lame Messiah. Later, when Christ was to ask his disciples, to whose do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? The responses included John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, and others of the prophets risen again. Similarly, when the delegations of priests and Levites from the temple went to the wilderness to interrogate John, they asked whether he was Elijah, that prophet, or the Messiah. Both New Testament incidents demonstrate an anticipation on the part of the Jews of a day of res restoration involving the coming and return of many of the Lord's servants, anointed ones. The prophetic word had become for them a collage of images in which they were unable to identify the true Messiah. 25 verse 19, according to the words of the prophets, meant, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, and any man or woman who is a possessor of such a witness is a prophet or a prophetess. Indeed, since the declaration of the reality of the power of the Savior is the preeminent message of God's chosen servants from the day of Adam forward, none of the prophets have written or prophesied, save they have spoken concerning Christ. Jacob says, Behold, I say unto you that none of the prophets have written nor prophesied, say they have spoken concerning this Christ. His name shall be called Jesus. 
One of the marvelous contributions of modern revelation, including the Book of Mormon, is an insight into the nature of the Christ eternal gospel, the revelation to the church and to the world that Christian prophets have taught Christian doctrine and a mystery in Christian ordinances since the days of Adam. Christianity began with Adam. The name of the Messiah revealed to us as Jesus Christ, meaning literally Jehovah is salvation, the anointed one, was known from the very beginning of earth's history. God spoke to Adam as follows, quoting Moses 6, 51, 52, I made the world and men before they were in the flesh. And God also said unto him, If thou wilt return to me and hearken unto my voice and believe and repent of all thy transgressions and be baptized even with water in the name of my only begotten Son, who is full of grace and truth, which is Jesus Christ, ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You can see the same gospel is taught anciently as today. 25 verse 20, the phrase, I have spoken plainly that ye cannot err. Nephi's words will stand as a testimony because of their plainness. Even they'll stand as a testimony for us or against us, depending on whether we believed him. The phrase, as the Lord God liveth, means Nephi here swears with an oath that Christ is the only name under heaven by which salvation comes. And that day there was no more powerful way to attest to a verity than through the swearing of an oath. Nephi here makes the Lord, meaning in this case God the Father, his partner in testimony. Either Jesus is the Christ and salvation is through him, or else God ceases to be God. That's quite a powerful oath. The phrase, after they had been bitten by the poisonous serpents, this incident is described, brief, brief, described briefly in Numbers chapter 21, designed as a type, an actual historical event, which pointed in symbolic fashion to yet a more significant reality in the future, the future crucifixion of Christ. The phrase, smite the rock and the water should come forth, meant examples of this phenomena are found in Exodus 17.6 and Numbers 20. 20 verse 11. In Paul's language, ancient Israel ate of the same spiritual meat and drank of the same spiritual rock. That rock was Christ. As Moses, the mediator of the old covenant, brought forth water in the desert, so Christ, the mediator of the new covenant, would bring forth the waters of life in the desert of sin. The phrase, there is none other name given under heaven, refers to God has highly exalted his son Christ, Paul taught, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Names are symbolic expressions which characterize persons and things. The name of Christ is holy, for Christ is the Holy One of Israel. In his name miracles are wrought, the blind are made to see, the deaf to hear, the lame to walk, and the dead are raised. Unto him people are baptized at the manner of his burial, and raised to new life in his name. Unto him the faithful are born again. Okay, did you catch that? Baptism does not wash away sins. Let children don't have any sins, and even adults who are converting to the church. The Holy Ghost burns sin out. Baptism is symbolic of the death and burial and resurrection of Christ. They take upon them his name and become members of his family. This doctrine, the doctrine of the preeminence of our Lord and of the power of his name, is as old as the world. Adam was taught that all men must repent and be baptized in the name of the only begotten, the only name which shall be given under heaven, whereby salvation shall come unto the children of men. 25 verse 21, Nephite records preserved for future generations. Nephi was commanded by the Lord to keep his record. He knew he had been commanded to write, and he knew what to write. He may not have always known why he should write, but he did know that their records would be preserved and given to future generations to assist in the restoration. Chapter 25, verse 22, judged by our willingness to receive the Book of Mormon. President Ezra Taft Benson discussed the importance of studying the Book of Mormon and how neglecting that study may have unforeseen consequences. Quote, do eternal consequences rest upon the response to this book? Yes, either to our blessing or to our condemnation. Every Latter-day Saint should make the study of this book a lifetime pursuit. 
Otherwise, he is placing his soul in jeopardy and neglecting that which could give spiritual and intellectual unity to his whole life. There is a difference between a convert who is built on the rock of Christ of the Book of Mormon and stays hold of that iron rod and one who is not. End of quote. 25 verse 23, the doctrine of grace. Salvation, which is exaltation or eternal life, comes through the merits and mercy and condescension of God. It comes by grace. It is a divine gift made available through the love of the Father and the selfless sacrifice of the Son. We do not earn it or deserve it. It's because of their love, and we show our love for him, by doing the works he's commanded us to by keeping his commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. That's what our works are for. They're to show our faith and love in Jesus Christ. They do not have power to save us. There are many things which are simply beyond the power of man to bring to pass. Man can neither create nor redeem himself. Such activities require the investigation of beings greater than he. We need the grace of Christ, and it will be only through that added grace that we will be able to become like him. And we access that grace through faith. Look at Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 2. You access his grace, this enabling power that we do not have, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what is faith? Faith is doing what God wants when he wants it done, and how he wants it done. Doing his will, not our will. Satan would have Christians err on this doctrine in one of two directions. First of all, there are those who contend that man is saved by grace alone, and that no works of any kind are of value. Such persons might reconstruct Nephi's language as follows. We are saved by grace after all, after all we can do. Salvation by grace alone and without works, Elder McConkie observed, as it is taught in large segments of Christendom today, is akin to what Lucifer proposed in pre-existence, that he would save all mankind and one soul should not be lost. He would save them without agency, without works, without any act on their part. So the works that we do is to show our faith, not to save us. But we must show our faith before we can access Christ's grace. As with the proposal of Luther and the pre-existence to save all mankind, so with the doctrine of salvation by grace alone. Without works, it is taught in modern Christendom, both concepts are false. There is no salvation in either of them. They both come from the same source. They are not of God. On the other hand, there are those who become so obsessed with their own works of righteousness, with all the programs in the church that must do this and I must do this, I have a checklist of things I got to do, with their own goodness, that they do not look to Christ as the true fountain of all righteousness. Men and women must rely wholly upon the merits of him who is mighty to save. If all the things we are doing in the church are not pointing us to Christ, then you're just wasting your time. There is no program, whether it's going to the temple, going on a mission, being sealed, the endowment, nothing has power. None of these programs have power to save us, not one of them. But in them, Christ has asked us to do them to demonstrate our faith in him. And then through that faith, his grace is given to us that we cannot obtain in any other way. In the purest sense, the works of righteousness which a person performs, ordinances of salvation, and deeds of Christian service are necessary, but are insufficient to lead to salvation. They're necessary for us to show faith. No matter what a man may do in this life, his works will not save him. He will always fall short and thus be an unprofitable servant. Without the grace or the divine assistance of God, indeed it is only after a person has so performed a lifetime of works and faithfulness only after he has come to deny himself of all ungodliness and every worldly lust that the grace of God, that spiritual increment of power, is efficacious. In the language of Moroni, yea, come unto Christ and be perfected in him and deny yourselves of all ungodliness. And if you will deny yourselves of, unlo- un- yourselves of all 
ungodliness and love God with all your might, mind and strength, then is his grace sufficient for you that by his grace you may be perfect in him. So we do all the things we are asked to, the commandments, our covenants, our ordinances, so that we will show him that we will deny ourselves of all in godliness and we will only follow the Father and his Son and their will. And we will do that at any sacrifice, even if it requires all sacrifice of every earthly thing and even our lives. Once we have shown that we are willing to completely submit our will, then is Christ's grace sufficient to make up the difference and bring us into his kingdom. Salvation is free. Justification is free, wrote Elder Bruce R. McConkie. Neither of them can be purchased, neither can be earned. Neither come by the law of Moses, or by good works, or by any power or ability that man has. Salvation is free, freely available, freely to be found. It comes because of his goodness and grace, because of his love and mercy, and condescension towards the children of men. Continuing, Elder McConkie explained, Free salvation is salvation by grace. The questions then are, what salvation is free? What salvation comes by grace of God? With all the emphasis of the rolling thunders of Sinai, we answer, all salvation is free. All comes by the merits and mercy and grace of the Holy Messiah. There is no salvation of any kind, nature, or degree that is not bound to Christ and his atonement. Elder Dallin H. Oaks of the Quorum of the Twelve discussed the eff effects of grace and how grace is an important doctrine for members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Quote, Some Christians accuse Latter-day Saints of denying the grace of God through claiming they can earn their own salvation. We answer this accusation with the words of two Book of Mormon prophets, Nephi Tai, taught, for we labor diligently to persuade our children to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God, for we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. And what is all we can do? It surely includes repentance and baptism, keeping the commandments and enduring to the end. Moroni pleaded, Yea, come unto Christ and be perfected in him, and deny yourselves of all ungodliness. And if you shall deny yourselves of all ungodliness and love God with all your might, mind, and strength, then is his grace sufficient for you, that by his grace you may be perfect in Christ. We are not saved in our sins, as by being unconditionally saved through confessing Christ and then inevitably committing sins in our, the, our remaining lives. We are saved from our sins by a weekly renewal of our repentance and cleansing through the grace of God and his blessed plan of salvation. End of quote. Secondly, 525.24, notwithstanding we believe in Christ, we keep the law. Meant, as explained earlier, the Nephites lived the law of Moses in the sense that they obeyed the endless ethical laws and abided in the myriad moral restrictions. They kept the Ten Commandments, they observed the law of animal sacrifice, but there was not a, a Levitical lifestyle. They had the higher priesthood and the everlasting gospel, remember? The high was from the tribe of Manasseh, and Ishmael and his daughters that came along was from the tribe of Ephraim. There were no Levites with Lamanites, so that's why they didn't have the Levitical priesthood. So they functioned under the Melchizedek priesthood that was given to Lehi. Their vision was more keen than that of their old world's kinmen. They were able to recognize the person and powers and religion of Christ, the Lord, behind the rituals of the preparatory gospel. The Old Testament Jews, for some reason, had a hard time putting the symbolism of the Law of Moses together to point to Christ and his suffering. They turned the Law of Moses into something that would save them. The phrase, until the law shall be fulfilled, meant the cessation of the law was to coincide with the consummation of the mission and atonement of Jesus Christ. As important as was his sinless life, his peerless teachings, and his immaculate example, the law, which was but a type of his great and last sacrifice, could only be completely filled in the sacrifice and death of the Lamb of God. The law of Moses was one grand prophecy of the Savior and his atonement. Christ fulfilled the law in the sense that he was the realization, the fulfillment of the prophecy. 
After his death and ascension, while visiting the Nephites, the master taught, The law which was given unto Moses hath an end in me. Behold, I am the law and the light. Look unto me, and endure to the end, and ye shall live. End of quote. 25 verse 25. For this end was the law given, meaning the law of Moses was given in the words of Paul as a schoolmaster until Christ. It was given one because of the transgressions of the children of Israel, because of their inability to abide the terms and conditions of the everlasting gospel, and thus to receive the blessings of the higher priesthood. And two, to point out transgressions, to point up one's inability to meet the challenges of mortality without a Redeemer, without divine assistance. Few matters are more well established in the Book of Mormon than the fact that the law of Moses was given to direct men's hopes and faith towards Jesus Christ. The phrase, the law has become dead unto us, meant, inasmuch as the Nephites had the spiritual maturity to see beyond the type, to look beyond the law to the lawgiver, to penetrate the myriad means to the great end, it was with them as if there was no law of Moses, no lesser or preparatory gospel. Life was and is and forever will be in Christ, yet they lived the law of Moses because of the commandments. The Nephites were able to see the type and symbolism in the law of Moses, and it pointed them and directed them to Christ. The phrase alive in Christ because of our faith meant, if I build again, Paul wrote, the things which I destroyed, that is, if I seek to restore that which has passed away, to give place for that which have been fulfilled, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. So we become alive through Christ, not through the law of Moses. That's how it becomes dead unto us, because we now focus on the life of Christ. Chapter 25, verse 26, we talk of Christ. Adam was taught by an angel that he and the posterity would do all that they did in the name of the Son, and that there they were to repent and call upon God in the name of the Son forevermore. Moroni pleaded, see that ye are not baptized unworthily, see that ye partake not of the sacrament unworthily, but see that ye do all things in worthiness, and do it in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. And if you do this and endure to the end, you will in no wise be cast out. Jesus Christ is the author, I'm sorry that should be is, is the author and finisher of our faith. The way to the Father, salvation is in him and through his holy name and in none other way. It is only through rejoicing in Christ, preaching of Christ, and prospering of Christ that the saints in any age are able to center their hopes in him who is eternal and thereby eventually lay hold on the promise of eternal life. In the days of Nephi, it was essential that the preachers of righteousness continually point the minds of their listeners towards the coming of Christ so that the Nephite people might recognize the limits and purposes of the law. In our own day, it is perhaps even more necessary to rejoice, preach, and prophesy of Christ so that men and women might have a constant reminder that peace and happiness here and eternal reward hereafter are not to be found in any programs and procedures alone. That philosophy is men, even those which are occasionally mingled with holy writ, are frequently at best deficient and at worst perverse. And that man, despite his supposed enlightened and noble status, has not the power to regenerate or renew himself. We preach of Christ so that all men, so that all might know and acknowledge their human weakness and thereby realize that in him strength is to be found. 25 verse 26, rejoice in Christ. President Gordon B. Hinckley noted that knowledge gained through the restoration allows us to truly rejoice in our Savior. Quote, as a church, we have critics, many of them. They say we do not believe in the traditional Christ of Christianity. There is some substance to what they say. Our faith, our knowledge, is not based on ancient tradition, the creeds which came of a finite understanding and out of, of the almost infinite discussions of men trying to arrive at a definition of the risen Christ. 
Our faith, our knowledge, comes of the witness of of our prophet in this dispensation who saw before him the great God of the universe and his beloved son, the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. They spoke to him, meaning Joseph Smith. He spoke with them. He testified openly, unequivocally, and unbashedly of that great vision. It was a vision of the Almighty and of the Redeemer of the world, glorious beyond our understanding, but certain and unequivocating in the knowledge which it brought. It is out of that knowledge, rooted deep in the soil of modern revelation, that we, in the words of Nephi, talk of Christ. We rejoice in Christ. We preach of Christ, we prophesy of Christ, and we write according to our prophecies that we and our children may know to what source we may look for remission of our sins. End of quote. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, connecting rejoicing of Christ with the mandate to obey the laws and ordinance of the gospel, said, quote, My greatest thrill and the most joyful of all realizations is that I have the opportunity, as Nephi phrased it, to talk of Christ, rejoice in Christ, preach of Christ, and prophesy of Christ, whenever I may be and with whomever I may find myself until the last breath of my life is gone. Surely there could be no higher purpose or greater privilege than that of special witness of the name of Christ in all the world. But my greatest anxiety stems from that very same commission. A line of scripture reminds us with searing understatement that they which preach the gospel should live the gospel. Beyond my words and teachings and spoken witness, my life must be a part of that testimony of Jesus. My very being should reflect the divinity of this work. I could not bear it if anything I ever say or do would any way diminish your faith in Christ, your love for this church, or the esteem on which you hold the holy apostleship. End of quote. 25 verse 27, the life which is in Christ means, In him was life, John the Baptist wrote, and the life was the light of men. I am come that they might have life, Jesus said, and that they may have it more abundantly. The abundant life is only to be found through accepting Christ, receiving the ordinances of salvation, administered by those having authority in the church and enduring them faith unto the end. In Christ is to be found eternal life. Thus Nephi states, this is why they taught their children the deadness of the law of Moses, that salvation could not be found in the law alone. Therefore, the need to point them to Christ. 25 verse 28, the phrase, by denying him, ye also deny the prophets and the law. Nephi had spoken with such plainness that salvation is found in Christ and not the law of Moses, and that his teachings will stand as a testimony against them because he had taught them the right ways to come to Christ. The irony of rejecting Jesus of Nazareth in the meridian of time was, one, Jesus was the same holy being, Jehovah, who had given the law of Moses anciently. And two, the law, if understood properly through the spirit of inspiration, pointed directly to Jesus as the mediator of the new covenant and the promised Messiah. To the Pharisees, Jesus pointedly proclaimed, You keep not the law. If you had kept the law, you would have received me, for I am he who gave the law. Further, why teach ye the law and deny that which is written, and condemn him whom the Father has sent to fulfill the law, that ye might all be redeemed? The phrase, believe in Christ and deny him not, Elder Charles Didier of the Seventy indicated the importance of listening to the Savior and as leaders on earth to strengthen testimony, quote, Once a testimony is placed, just like a fire that needs fuel and oxygen to burn, it needs to be fed and tended, or it will burn out and die. A dying testimony corresponds, in fact, to a forthcoming denial of Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. Unfortunately, there are those who gain testimonies and then deny them and lose them. How does this happen? If you follow the steps to obtain a testimony, you do exactly the opposite to deny it or lose it. Do not pray. The door of revelation will be closed. Do not be humble, but listen to your own superior voice. Do not participate in ordinance of the gospel, but follow the practices of the world. Do not follow church leaders, but be critical of them. Do not listen to prophets and follow their counsel, but interpret their declarations according to your own desires. Do not obey the commandments, but live according to your own appetites and desires. End of quote. Certainly, you will lose any knowledge of Christ following that pattern. 25 verse 
25, verse 29, ye must worship him. Elder Bruce Almacong has written that, quote, in addition to worshiping the Father, our great and eternal head, by whose word men are, are there is a sense in which we worship the Son. We pay divine honor, reverence, and homage to him because of his atoning sacrifice, because immortality and eternal life come through him. He does not replace the Father in receiving reverence, honor, and respect, but he is worthy to receive all the praise and glory that our whole souls have power to possess. End of quote. Jesus Christ, after having detailed how it was that he had received divine assistance as he gave himself to others, grace for grace, as well as he as our example developed line upon line in his growth towards the fullness of the glory of God, grace from grace to grace, concluded, I give unto you these sayings that you may understand and know how to worship and know what you worship, that you may come unto the Father in my name and in due time receive of his fullness. For if you keep my commandments, you shall receive of his fullness and be glorified in me as I am in the Father. Therefore I say unto you, you shall receive grace for grace. As set forth in the foregoing revelation, we worship the Son in that we seek to be like him. We worship him in that we strive to pattern our lives after his. That is to say, perfect worship is emulation. We honor those whom we imitate. The most perfect way of worship is to be holy as Jehovah is holy, to be as pure as Christ is pure. It is to do the things that enable us to become like the Father. In summary, we worship Christ by going from grace to grace until we receive the fullness of the Father and are glorified in light and truth as in the case with our pattern and prototype, the promised Messiah. The following stories show that our sufficiency is in Christ in him alone. Here are two stories that show that our sufficiency is only in Christ. We have to completely depend upon him. A pastor I knew was conducting a series of meetings in several churches in North and South Carolina. He was staying in a home of some close friends in Asheville and traveled each night to wherever he was speaking that evening. One night, he was scheduled to speak at a church in Greenville, South Carolina, which is several hours from Asheville. Because he didn't have a car, some friends from Greenville offered to transport him to and from the meeting. When they arrived to pick him up, he bid farewell to his host and told them he hoped to be back by midnight or soon after. After ministering at the Greenville Church, he stayed a while to enjoy some fellowship and the road, and then, and the road back to Asheville. Accordingly, the house he's of a pro, I'm sorry, approaching the house, he saw the porch light on and assumed his host would be prepared for his arrival because he had discussed the time of his return with them. As he got out of the car, he sent his driver on his way, saying, You must hurry. You have a long drive back home. I'm sure they're prepared for me. I'll have no problem. He felt the bitter cold of the winter night as he walked the long distance to the house. By the time he reached the porch, his nose and ears were already numb. He tapped gently on the door, but no one answered. He tapped a little harder and then even harder, but still no reply. Finally, concerned about the intense cold, he beat on the kitchen door and a side window, but there was still no response. Frustrated and becoming colder by the moment, he decided to walk to a neighboring house so that he could call and awaken his host. On the way, he realized that knocking on someone's door after midnight wasn't a safe thing to do, so he decided to find a public telephone. It was as dark as it was cold, and the pastor wasn't familiar with the area. Consequently, he walked for several miles. At one point, he slipped in the wet grass growing beside the road and slid down a bank to two feet of water. Soaked and nearly frozen, he crawled back up to the road and walked further until he saw finally a blinking motel light. He awakened the manager, who was gracious enough to let him use the telephone. The, the beraggled pastor made the call and said to his sleepy host, I hate to disturb you, but I couldn't get anyone in the house to wake up. I'm several miles down the road at the motel. Could you come and get me? To which his host replied, My dear young friend, you have a key in your pocket. Don't you remember? I gave it to you before you left. The pastor reached into his pocket. Sure enough, there was the key. That true story illustrates the predicament of Christians who try to gain access to God's blessings through human means, all the while possessing Christ, who is the key to every spiritual blessing. 
He alone fulfills the deepest longings of our hearts and supplies every spiritual resource we need. Brother and sisters, every one of us has the key to get back to Heavenly Father, and that key is Jesus Christ. The second story is a poor man who wanted to go on a cruise all his life. As a youngster, he had seen an advertisement for a luxury cruise, and ever since he had dreamed of speeding, spending a week on a large ocean liner, enjoying fresh sea air and relaxing in a luxurious environment, he saved money for years, carefully counting his pennies, often sacrificing personal needs so he could stretch his resources a little further. Finally, he had enough to purchase a ticket, a cruise ticket. He went to a travel agent, looked over the cruise brochures, picked out the one that was especially attractive, and bought a ticket with the money he had saved for so long. He was hardly able to believe he was about to realize his childhood dream. Knowing he could not afford the kind of elegant food pictured in the brochure, the man planned to bring his own provisions for the week. Accustomed to moderation for years of frugal living, frugal living, and with his entire savings going to pay for the cruise ticket, the man decided to bring along a week's supply of bread and peanut butter. That was all he could afford. The few few days of cruising were thrilling. The man ate peanut butter sandwiches alone in his room each morning and spent the rest of his time relaxing in the sunlight and fresh air, delighted to be aboard the ship. By midweek, however, the man was beginning to notice that he was the only person on board who was not eating luxurious meals. It seemed that every time he sat on the deck or rested in a lounge or stepped outside his cabin, a porter would walk by with a huge meal for someone who had ordered room service. By the fifth day of the cruise, the man could take it no longer. The peanut butter sandwiches seemed stale and tasteless. He was desperately hungry, and even the fresh air and sunshine had lost their appeal. Finally, he stopped a port and exclaimed, Tell me how I might get one of those meals. I am dying for some decent food. I will do anything if you say to earn it. Why, sir, don't you have a ticket for this cruise? The porter asked. Certainly, said the man, but I spent everything I had for the ticket. I have nothing left with which to buy food. But, sir, said the porter, didn't you realize? Meals are included with your passage. You may eat as much as you like. Lots of Christians live like that man, not realizing the ultimate provisions that are theirs in Christ. They munch on still scraps. There's no need to live like that. Everything we could ever want or need is included in the cost of admission, and the Savior has already paid it for us. Oh, brothers and sisters, may we use the key to enter Christ's kingdom through faith, repentance, baptism, and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. And then we are free to feast as much as we want freely upon the words of Christ. May we do so to help us to become like him and the Father. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button.